Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us again for another session of the WNS Operative Grand Rounds. We're privileged again to have with us Dr. Gay Russo from Chicago, from North Shore University Medical Center. She has extensive experience with treatment of skull-based tumors, including pituitary tumors. And we're really excited to have her today, to have her talk to us about comprehensive assessment and surgical treatment of pituitary tumors. I think this will be not only very useful for those who perform pituitary surgery, but also for those who will be preparing to take their boards. So Gail, on the behalf of our viewers, I want to thank you and we're very excited to listen to your thoughts. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Okay. Well, you know, we're all uh, just uh, dwarfs on the sh shoulders of giants, aren't we? And I'd like to uh, give a nod to Ed Laws, my mentor, who from the very beginning said, it, uh, you're going to be teaching uh, and doing pituitary tumor work. You need to know about comprehensive management, not only about how to do the surgery, although that's of critical importance, but really how to manage the problem for patients, to be the quarterback of this uh, problem. So that's why we've structured today's talk on the comprehensive management of patients with pituitary tumors. It's a nod to him and those who came before. So what I'd like to talk about today are just a few general remarks. Pituitary adenomas, as you know, are the third most common of the primary brain tumors. They occur in about 20% of routine autopsies, hence the Pituitary Patient Association launching their one in five campaign to raise awareness about this condition. About 20% of primary brain tumors in U.S. residency programs are performed via a transtenoidal route, and that number is increasing, so we want to be sure that we are uh, developing uh, profound expertise in that surgical route of approach. So today I'd like to talk about the diagnosis and medical management of pituitary tumors, as well as their microsurgical treatment, radiosurgical treatment, say a few words about apoplexy and metastatic lesions, and just conclude as we always do with patient advocacy and education. So uh, the secretory tumors, of course, need to be considered uh, first and foremost. The most common of these are prolactinoma, followed by acromegaly and Cushing's disease, and then the more rare tumors, such as the TSH-producing tumors. So here's an example of a prolactinoma, which in my experience tends to be among the more invasive of the secretory lesions, in this case invading the clivus. Now, when we're called to see patients who have an elevated prolactin and a pituitary tumor, we want to be sure that we have evaluated all the many reasons why a patient might have a high prolactin, uh, because we know that one in five patients are going to have a pituitary tumor, and we want to be sure that we are correctly establishing a relationship if there is one. Now, here are several uh, pharmacologic reasons why a patient might have an elevated prolactin. Antihypertensive, base inhibitors, H2 blockers, psychotropics, and opiates or cocaine abuse. So when you're evaluating the patient with hyperprolactinemia, first and foremost, exclude pregnancy. We know, we know that the uh, normal pituitary gland can double in size during pregnancy, and we never want to be making that mistake of associated hyperprolactinemia in pregnancy. We want to rule out thyroid, renal, and hepatic disease, which can also mimic a hyperprolactin, uh, hyperprolactinemia state and pituitary tumor. Stop the causative medications, which we just reviewed, then do an MRI and reevaluate this condition after menopause. Well, patients will often ask, well, what are the consequences of hyperprolactinemia and estrogen, estrogen deficiency? And otherwise, in other words, why should I care whether I have an elevated uh, prolactin level and a small, perhaps non-secreting tumor? Well, there are really two reasons why we should care. The first is osteopenia, and the relative risk for osteoporosis in these patients is about four and a half times normal. And then there are the hypogonadal symptoms, and these two things combine to make us want to treat hyperprolactinemia. The etiology of prolactinomas is generally monoclonal, there seems to be an alteration in the long arm of chromosome 11, and we know that in particular in the multiple